Well, it is a uh, joy to be with you. Good to uh, be back in Ireland. I am asked uh, repeatedly as I travel where my accent is from. And I said, well, I was born in England, I was raised in Ireland, and lived in New Zealand for 15 years. And if you put all those accents together, that's the language I'm speaking to you in. Uh, my father used to say when he ministered in America, the redeeming thing about Americans is that while they don't speak English, at least they understand it. And uh, so I trust you can understand my accent. Uh, it's a little mixed up and uh, confused these days, but it is a uh, delight uh, to uh, be with you this morning. Let's uh, just look to the Lord in prayer again, shall we? Father, once again, we turn our gaze upon you, Lord. Father, your word says as the eye of a maid looks to a mistress, as the eye of a servant looks to the master, Lord, so we turn our gaze upon you. Lord, we say, unless the Lord builds a house, we labor in vain. And so, Lord, we invite you to come by the power of your Spirit and do what you promised to do. You said, I will build my church. Father, this is your church, redeemed by your blood. Father, we don't belong to any man. We don't belong to any denomination or any movement. Father, we're redeemed again by the blood of the Lamb. And Father, we ask, Lord, uh, do that work that only you can do. It's God that worketh in us. And so, Father, work in us this morning. Have your way, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to the uh, book of Romans. Romans uh, chapter 13, and the last four verses. I'm going to uh, read the verses to you, and then I want to give you a very uh, brief outline, and then we will work through the outline together. I'm uh, reading from the New American uh, version here, so uh, bear with me. Verse 11, it says, And do this, or this do, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone. The day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. I believe this is a very relevant uh, verse of Scripture, passage of Scripture for the day and age in which you and I live. That doesn't mean that the rest of the Scripture is not relevant, but there is a special I believe, a word here for us. I want to give you a very quick outline, and then, like I say, we will work through the outline together. The first thing is, it is time to wise up. The second thing, it is time to wake up. The third thing, it's time to clean up. Number four, it's time to dress up. Number five, it's time to grow up. Number six, it's time to lock up or close up. And then we could add a seventh, it is time to act up. That will become evident as we look at this portion of Scripture uh, together. Notice Paul begins, he says, do this or all of this is contingent upon knowing the time. We have an expression in America, I don't know how popular it is here in uh, Ireland, but it is wise up. And uh, we say to people, wise up. In other words, you don't know what's going on. You've got your head buried in the, si uh, the sand. You're out of touch. You uh, aren't aware of uh, what is happening around about you, so wise up. I think Paul is saying here spiritually, we need to wise up. And the way in which he says that is, wise up by knowing the time. Now, the problem with time is it is so vast. If you take your car in for repairs and you say to the mechanic, when will it be ready? And he says, sometime. Well, that's true, but that's not good enough for me. That could be in my lifetime. It could be in the lifetime of my grandchildren uh, because time is so vast. The only way we can really understand time is to break it down into increments. We talk about a millennium, a thousand years. We talk about, say, hundred years. We talk about 10 years. Uh, 
or uh, five years or three years. We talk about months, we talk about weeks, we talk about days, we talk about hours, we talk about minutes. In other words, time has to be defined in increments. We say to somebody, I'll be with you in a few minutes, or come back in a, uh, a couple of hours, or it'll be three days at least before I'm able to repair it. And the Greeks had different words for time, and the word that Paul uses here is the word kairos. It means a very specific moment in time, knowing this specific time, not time generally, but time specifically. And we need to be conscious again of what time it is. How can I illustrate that? It is, uh, you know, a kairos moment has the, the thought behind it of, of seizing that particular moment not letting that moment go away. Maybe for the ladies, it's, uh, you know, maybe there is a sale, a seven-hour sale only, and everything in the store is marked down 50%, but it's only for one day, and it's only for those seven hours. That's a Kairos moment. If I miss it, the sale is over. Maybe you're at the auction, and you're bidding on cattle. Maybe some of the farmers here, and again, you get distracted momentarily, and then you hear the, the closing bids going, and you know, unless I indicate right now, I'm not going to get that uh, bull or whatever it is that you're bidding on. Again, those are kairos moments. We have kairos moments in our lives individually when we uh, get the news that maybe a loved one has been uh, killed or there's, uh, we've been diagnosed with some uh, serious disease or some other thing, but there are kairos moments. We have kairos moments in our nation. America, of course, in the, the uh, year 2001 had a very... Kairos moment, if you like. Everybody will remember what happened when the Twin Towers in the, the uh, great city of New York were destroyed and thousands of lives were lost. That was a Kairos moment. I remember where I was. I was on a, fl a flight on Korean Airlines flying to Korea and then down into Malaysia. We had uh, left uh, the Dallas airport been flying for about five hours somewhere out over the Aleutian Islands there uh, off the coast of Alaska when the pilot uh, came on and informed us there'd been some sort of calamity, catastrophe in America, and all the flights were being diverted back. And so there in the early hours of the morning, our flight turned around, we landed in Anchorage, and for the next two or three days, I was not able to travel because all the, uh, the flights were canceled. My wife called me the next day to inform me my mother had died down in Argentina. So those, that was a Kairos moment in my life. I will never forget that particular moment in time, and I'm sure many of you have got those Kairos moments. But uh, Paul is speaking here about spiritually. He's not talking about the natural. Do you know what's going on spiritually? What time is it? Jesus said to the scribes and the Pharisees, he he said, uh, you don't have a clue what is going on. He said, you can discern the sky and the weather by uh, looking at the sky, but he says, you don't know what's going on spiritually around about you. You're blind, leaders of the blind. You don't have any understanding of what is going on. And so we are warned uh, repeatedly in the Word of God about time. The Bible says the days are evil here. John wrote in his epistle, he says, it is the last days. If that was true 2,000 years ago, then we are down not only to the last days, but the last moments in time. Paul, writing to Timothy, warns them. He says, in the last days, he said, men will be lovers of money. They will be lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Those are all indications, again, of the time in which you and I are living. We're told in the Word of God to redeem the time. In other words, to use this time. I uh, grew up uh, singing a little chorus, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I'm dying, how glad I will be that the light of my life was burned out for thee. And so time. The disciples came to Jesus there in Matthew chapter 24, and they asked him a question, what are some of the signs of your coming? And of course, we have read that. I'm sure you have many, many times. We are familiar with that portion of Scripture, and yet, uh, you know, we need to see how relevant that uh, particular portion of Scripture is to the day and age in which we live. Jesus said there'd be wars and rumors of wars. There would be uh, famines and earthquakes and pestilence and so on. I made a, a list here working on um, uh, various websites and uh, looking at various articles. Let me just uh, run through some of these. We uh, have had 150 major wars in the world since World War II. 
Right now we have 190 nations embroiled in some sort of a conflict. Again, Jesus said, when you see wars and rumors of wars, look up for your redemption draws nigh. He talked about earthquakes from the year 100 to the year 1800, that's a 1700 year period, there were 21 major earthquakes. Between 1950 and 1991, there were 93. We have an average uh, earthquake every year of one of a magnitude of eight or higher, 17 of uh, seven to eight, 134 of six to uh, nine, uh, 1300 from five to 5.9, and I won't go on with the, the list, it is, uh, is endless. My wife and I just two years ago were in the earthquake in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand. We have a daughter that lives there, four grandchildren, a son-in-law. We were there visiting when the house just shook and that house has to be torn down now. One entire wall collapsed, the windows fell out and so on, but uh, much of the city was destroyed. Something like $20 billion worth of damage took place in just a matter of uh, 30 or 40 seconds as that city was just shaken to the very core. It's happened to just about every church was destroyed. The entire city is having to be rebuilt. But uh, those are all indications, Jesus said. When you see those things, he said, these are just the beginning of birth pangs. Every uh, mother here knows that when the birth pangs uh, begin, they do not diminish as the baby approaches, but there is a quickening. The, the, the distance or the time between the birth pangs gets faster and faster. And we are seeing again an escalation of events that are taking place that Jesus warned us would happen. Famine, we have around 10 million people that die every year because of famine. Pestilence, in the last 30 years, we have had uh, 30 brand new diseases that have come along. AIDS, of course, is right on the 30, 35 year uh, bracket there, where uh, previous to this, these diseases were not known, but Jesus warned us of these uh, pestilences, persecution, 163,000 believers are martyred every single year for the cause of Christ. Hard for us to get our mind around, but that is going on at a regular uh, rate. Jesus said you would be hated by all nations as a result of the Word of God. And I have to inform Americans, maybe I have to inform the Irish too, that there's no exception because we are British or because we're American. The Bible says you will be hated by all nations. We are seeing, at least in our own nation in America, a turning now where uh, the, uh, the Christians are being targeted like never before. In fact, my father used to say, if the church doesn't concentrate in prayer, they will pray in concentration camps. And I remember when he said that 20 plus years ago that I used to sort of snicker under my breath thinking that will never happen in America. And yet we are seeing again a increase of persecution towards uh, true believers. We are the ones, again, that cry out against abortion. We cry out about the pedophiles and homosexuality and so on. And of course, the tide is turning. And now we are the ones that are being targeted as being the ones that are intolerant and so on and so forth. And uh, we are going to see an increase. Believe me, as the, uh, as the days go by, we're just on the verge of seeing that take place. Jesus warned us that there would be false Christs. We have in America on a, an average of 2,000 false messiahs. These are people that believe they've heard from God. They have got their little group of believers that meet together somewhere, maybe up in the mountains. They've got their compounds and so on. Jesus warned us again that this would take place. I understand there are 80,000 practicing witches in England. Uh, of course, the Harry Potter books have uh, made uh, the demonic realm uh, popular to an entire generation of uh, young people, the curses and everything else that we find in those. We could go on and on. Drugs, of course, is now a major problem that uh, back uh, again when I was a child was hardly heard of, but uh, just about every city in America, every little village, if you like, in America has a drug problem now. And of course, the uh, book of Revelation says that uh, the whole world will be deceived by the, uh, the sorceries. And the word sorcery there in the Greek is the word pharmakia, the word that we get our word pharmacy from. And so the drug problem now is epidemic around the world. We have a problem with uh, pornography, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. So it would be at the coming of the Son of Man. We have somewhere between 25 million and 250 million pornographic websites now available on the World Wide Web. Nobody can keep uh, track of them. They're coming online 
at such a rapid rate. We spend $57 billion a year in pornography in America, $3 billion alone in child pornography, $4.5 billion in phone sex, $2.5 billion pornographic emails are sent out every single day, 27,000 people visit pornographic websites every single second in America. Here is the great tragedy. 76% of ministers that were interviewed said they had visited a pornographic website at least once. Again, this is a major, major problem now that we are facing. AIDS, of course, another problem, human trafficking. 27 million people cross international dateline or the uh, uh, countries uh, every year because of the, uh, the sex uh, trade industry and so on. All of those things to say this, do you know what time it is? Do you know what time it is? Paul said, knowing the time. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to take place, look up, your redemption draws nigh. And so the first thing is we need to wise up. We need to understand that we cannot uh, any longer just uh, live in a place of sort of complacency and difference. God is wanting us to uh, wake up. And so it says, first of all, knowing the time. The second thing it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. Paul says, knowing the time, let us awaken out of sleep. Now, time de determines whether you wake or not. That's true in the natural, isn't it? You uh, wake up in the middle of the night. I have a digital clock when I'm at home sitting uh, beside my bed. Sometimes I wake up at uh, two o'clock in, uh, in the morning and that clock indicates to me this is not the time to get up. Now, if I happen to uh, sleep in and I look at that clock and it's seven o'clock, I think, boy, you know, I should have been up some time ago. I need to get up. In other words, knowing the time determines what you do. And so uh, Paul says, now that you know the time, it is time for you to awaken out of sleep. Obviously, he is not talking here about sleep in the natural. He's talking about that place of lethargy, indifference, apathy, Again, neutrality, that uh, place of sort of uh, lukewarmness, if you like. Let me give you a reference in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 6. Paul says, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Let us not sleep as others do. Now, obviously, the Bible says God gives His beloved sleep. We need sleep in the natural. We need to renew and uh, refresh our bodies, and uh, that is not what Paul is talking about. He's talking about the sleep of compromise, the sleep of just uh, being lethargic and thinking, well, one day I'll get serious about meeting God. One day I'll get serious in the area of prayer and Bible study and doing something for God, but right now I'm involved in business. Right now I'm involved in, in school and so on and so forth, and we begin to sort of compromise in our, in our life and in our walk with God, and we need to uh, wake up. One of the things the enemy loves, of course, is a complacent church, a sleeping church. You recall the story in the Old Testament of uh, Samson, who was terrorizing the Philistines, and they had to somehow uh, find out what is the secret, what is it about this man that uh, is, uh, he's able to do these amazing exploits and so on. And so, of course, they solicited the help of Delilah, Delilah became the sort of the undercover agent to try and find out what is it about this man? What is the secret to his strength? And of course, she tried everything, and uh, Samson uh, had a little bit of fun at her expense. Well, try this and try that, and then sort of got a chuckle out of it when it didn't work, and then finally she tried tears. And it's pretty hard for the men to resist the tears when they begin. And uh, poor old Samson, as strong as he was, uh, began to melt, and he disclosed the fact that, listen, it has nothing to do with my strength. I am strong because of the vows. I am a Nazarite. I was set apart by my parents as a child. I've maintained that Nazarite vow. And as a result of that, I'm able to do the things that I do. And he says, the secret to my strength is in the fact that I've never cut my hair. That's part of my Nazarite vow. And once she knew that, she now had the key to this man's life. And yet she is powerless, even though she has the knowledge, she is now powerless to do anything until she gets him to sleep. And the Bible says she made him sleep on her knees. And while he was sleeping, of course, the Philistines move in, the enemy moved in, they sh uh, cut his hair, and he woke up and uh, 
again understood the Spirit of God had left him. And uh, it is all because, again, he was sleeping when he should have been awake. We have the story, of course, of Peter, the other disciples as, as well, that were sleeping there when Jesus went into the garden to pray. And he said to his disciples, could you not watch with me just one hour? But he targets Peter specifically, and he says, Peter, watch and pray. Lest you enter into temptation, Jesus knowing that the enemy had targeted the life of Peter. And it was only a matter of maybe an hour, maybe even less than that, that uh, Peter had ended up betraying the Lord. Why? Because he was sleeping when he should have been alert. We have the story of the, uh, the virgins, the ten virgins who are waiting for the, the uh, bridegroom to come. And of course, the Bible says that he delayed his coming. They got drowsy. They fell asleep. And as a result, the, finally, the bridegroom, the announcement was made. The bridegroom came. He's coming. And they woke up, but some of them were not prepared. They didn't have oil in their lamps. But again, they were sleeping when they should have been awake. Matthew 13, we have the story of the man who sowed good seed in his field. And yet the Bible says that while he was sleeping, the enemy came and he sowed tears among the, uh, the good seed. All of these things took place, again, when men were sleeping. And we need to guard in our own life that we don't become sleepy spiritually, that we don't become indifferent and apathetic and lukewarm and we settle down in our Christian life. When's the last time you read the Word of God? When's the last time you prayed? When's the last time you witnessed to somebody? It's so easy, isn't it, to become complacent, just to go on again as though nothing is going to change. All things are just the way they were, and uh, we don't have to do anything. God is wanting to stir us. He's wanting us to wake up. He's wanting to get our attention. And so, again, it is time to, uh, to wake up. The third thing, it's time to clean up. You'll notice if you have uh, been alert that this portion of Scripture, Paul is taking a page out of our everyday life, our everyday routine. Everybody here over the age of uh, five, I guess, or six, you wake up in the morning, you, uh, what's the first thing you do? After you wake up, you uh, clean up. After you clean up, you dress up. So Paul is taking a natural illustration here, but he is applying it spiritually. First of all, it's time to wise up. What time is it? Once we understand the time, we try and rub the sleep out of our eyes, so to speak, and we become aware of what time it is, then we, uh, we begin to wake up, and then we begin to clean up. Paul says here that we are to lay aside the deeds of darkness. Lay aside the deeds of darkness. Darkness, obviously, is anything that is contrary to the light of God's Word. Men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. And this is a time, I believe, in the church when, like never before, we need to be ready for the Lord's coming. The one message that preceded the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ was a message of repentance. And I believe that the message, again, that God is going to bring back into the church, and I say bring back because it's very rare, at least in our country in America, to hear a message on repentance. We have now become so seeker-sensitive. I don't know, hopefully that has not come to Ireland, but the seeker-sensitive message is that the, if you are going to fill your churches, you don't want to offend anybody. And the way you offend people is drawing attention to, the, to their sin. And so we don't want to mention sin anymore. And so some of these churches are huge, they're colossal, 20, 30, 40,000 people uh, in one gathering. But you'll never hear a message on sin from the, uh, the lips of those preachers. They're convinced that God has given them a special message, and that message is a message of encouragement. And so the message every single week is one that is very, very positive, very much affirming, and uh, never mentioning sin, never denouncing sin, and so on. And yet I believe that God is going to raise up a voice in these last days, again like John the Baptist, a voice that will denounce sin so that God's people can be set free. And then the only way we can do that again is uh, through repentance. And so Paul says we need to clean up. We need to be honest, brutally honest about our condition. Is there darkness in my life? Do I need to lay aside the deeds of darkness? Again, what we do in the natural, we need to do spiritually. I dare say there's nobody here this morning that still has a pajamas on. 
right? You, uh, you lay aside the clothes that you wear at nighttime that you sleep in, and you put on clothes for the day. Paul is using the same illustration here, obviously applying it spiritually, but he says lay aside the night attire, so to speak. Lay aside those deeds of darkness and put on, again, the armor of light. The uh, book of Revelation closes. You have that wonderful verse up there, but just prior to that, let me just read you the way the Bible virtually closes is in Revelation 22 and verse 11. Let the one that does wrong still do wrong. Let the one that is filthy still be filthy. Let the one that is righteous still practice righteousness. Let the one that is holy keep himself holy. That's the way the Bible closes, that final challenge. Listen, if you're going to be wrong, be wrong. But if you're going to be holy, be holy. There's a decision that you and I have to make in these last days. Jesus Christ is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. My Bible tells me without holiness, no man will see the Lord. No man. No exception. And we need to understand that uh, God is serious. Be ye holy as I am holy. Thank God that He imparts and gives us the grace to do that. It is not something we can do in and of ourselves. But He wants us to live a godly life, a holy life. And uh, He is the one that, uh, again, convicts us by the power of the Spirit of God to do that. Highlights those things in our life that are not pleasing to Him, and then we bring them to the blood. And thank God that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. Not just some sin, from all sin. Whatever your sin is this morning, the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient if we are prepared to repent and turn and lay aside that thing. I love the uh, portion of Scripture there in John 13 where Jesus comes and He uh, girds Himself, you recall, or basically He uh, strips Himself down, takes a towel, begins to wash His disciples' feet. And when He comes to Peter, Peter objects. Uh, it's embarrassing. After all, this one that they call Master and Rabbi and so on is uh, taking on the form of a servant. And Peter says, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, Peter, if you don't allow me to wash you, you have no part in me. I believe that Jesus is coming to the church again in these last days. And he's saying, listen, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. We need to know what it is to be clean. We've got to lay aside, again, the deeds of darkness. Anything that you know in your life that is contrary to the Spirit of God, to the ways of God, to the Word of God, has to be laid aside. And we have to get right with God. This is a day when we can no longer afford to just go on complacently again, not knowing the time. The next thing he says, number four, it's time to dress up. Again, we clean up before we dress up. Isn't that right? You can see the order here that Paul is using. Again, uh, taking a page out of our everyday routine. We wake up, we clean up, and we dress up. Now, one of the things that we are spoiled with, in, uh, at least in our Western civilization, especially in America, we have so many different types of clothing. You go to places like India and other places, and uh, you know, they dress the same virtually every single day, and the women have their saris and, uh, and so on. But in America, at least, we have a variety of uh, different clothes. We have uh, casual clothes. We have uh, uh, formal clothes. Uh, clothes. Uh, most of you are all dressed up this morning because uh, obviously you're going to church and, and so on, but uh, chances are if there are some farmers in our midst, and I'm sure there are, that that's not the way you ride around on your tractor, is the way you're dressed this morning. I doubt if there's any man here that, uh, you know, gets up and puts on his tie and his suit and gets on his tractor and goes out plowing the field. You have a different uh, set of clothing altogether. And the way in which you are dressed contributes to your activities. Is that right? My wife and I live opposite a dentist. And um, if I were to see him come out of his uh, house with a, uh, a bright uh, red uh, wool uh, shirt on and uh, heavy jeans and uh, steel-toed uh, uh, boots and a chainsaw in his hand, I know he's not going to be doing oral surgery that day. At least not on me. 
he is dressed to cut down trees and so on. On the other hand, if I see him come out and he's got a sweatband on and a white t-shirt and some uh, white shorts and he's holding a tennis racket, I know that he's going down to play tennis. The way in which you dress determines your activity. Isn't that right? And so notice the way Paul says we are to dress. He says it's time to dress up. He says, put on the armor of light. Put on the armor. Now, the only reason you put on armor is because you're going to war. The only reason you put on armor is because you have an adversary that is doing everything he can contrary to what God wants you to do. And we need to realize we have an adversary this morning. Your adversary, the devil, goes around seeking whom he may devour. In other words, the enemy wants to destroy the work of grace in your life, wants to undermine what God is doing, wants to bring discouragement and doubt and fear and anxiety or lure you back into sin, complacency, all of those things. We are at war. Spiritually, we're at war. And we have to put on the armor of light. Notice again, we've laid aside the deeds of darkness. You do not put on the armor of light over a filthy body, so to speak. The first of all has to be cleansing. There is a divine order, if you like, in this portion of Scripture that we lay aside one thing and then we put on the armor of light. The Bible does not cover sin. That's an Old Testament concept. The Bible cleanses from sin in the New Testament. And so we are cleansed from sin and then we put on the armor of light. We are to go to war. We are to go to battle. We are to understand the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The Bible says, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And uh, it's time for us to rise up and to Again, be the men and women of God that God wants us to, to be. So it's time that we dress up. Number five, it's time to grow up. He says, let us behave properly. In other words, our attitude should change according to the dress that we wear. You do not, uh, run, uh, you do not uh, play around with your you know, two or three-year-old uh, uh, children or grandchildren when you're all dressed up in sort of formal attire. You don't uh, roll around on the floor. No, you take off your clothes. You put on, uh, at least in America, put on sweats, uh, you know, some sort of casual wear, and uh, that way you can uh, sort of uh, have a uh, rough and tumble uh, time. Uh, but the way in which you dress, if you have on formal attire, you tend to walk uh, a little uh, more erect and so on because you're dressed for the occasion. Maybe you're going to a wedding, you've got tails on and a bow tie or something, you're all dressed up, but it, it affects the way you walk, isn't it? And spiritually, we are to change, the Bible says. We are to behave properly. Why? Because we have put on the armor of light. What is that armor? Paul goes on further to say, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we are to act like Him, think like Him. We are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. If I appeared in this uh, pulpit with a uh, flaming orange hair and a great big red nose and a multicolored uh, striped uh, uh, suit and a great big huge red tie and I was in a clown outfit, you would expect me to clown around. Why? Because I'm dressed like a clown. If I'm dressed like a clown, it would be uh, strange for me to all of a sudden be very prim and proper. You'd say, this is out of character. I'm expecting this man to do something clownish. I'm expecting him to, you know, keep pulling his handkerchief out of his pocket, you know, a mile long because that's what clowns do. I expect his shoes to be, you know, about this big instead of, you know, big red toes on them. And why? Because I'm, I'm acting as a clown. Now, if I'm acting like the Lord Jesus Christ, and I put on the Lord Jesus Christ, then it should change and alter my behavior. Isn't that right? Everything I, I do should draw attention to Him. And so Paul says it's time to grow up. He says not being involved in carousing and drunkenness. William Barclay said they, this is the, the word that is taken of men walking through a village at nighttime, they're drunk, they're out of control, they're boisterous, and they couldn't care less about the fact that people are trying to sleep and so on. They're just sort of causing a ruckus. Obviously, that is not the behavior of a man or a woman of God. Then he says sexual promiscuity. Barclay says that is the desire for the forbidden bed. In other words, not having control over your passions and your lustful desires and so on. Sensuality, having no shame regarding sin. 
Paul says these things should not be a part of the Christian life. In other words, we have been brought out of the world, come out from among them and be you separate, touch not the unclean thing, God says, then I will welcome you, and I will be a father unto you, and you will be sons and daughters unto me, saith the Lord. God is looking for a separated people, a people again that uh, exemplify in everything they do the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it is time to grow up. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the last one, it is time to lock up. Or if you like, it is time to close up. He says in verse 14, and make no provision for the flesh. When you make provision for something, you gather those things that are essential for whatever it is you're trying to do. In other words, if you're going to plow the field, then you are going to get the things that are necessary to plow the field. You're going to back the tractor up to the plow, you're going to hitch it up, uh, and so on. And if somebody comes and sees you doing that, they know that you're going to plow the field. You're making provision to do something. You're gathering together the implements that are necessary in order to accomplish a given task. And the Bible says here, we are to make no provision for the flesh. <clears throat> In other words, we don't visit those places, we don't turn on the, uh, the internet to, uh, and uh, begin to explore certain websites and so on. We don't turn on certain channels on the television, we avoid certain things and so on. We do not make provision. And so we have to lock up, we have to close up, if you like, our lives. One of my jobs when I pastored was after everybody left, I was always the last one out of the building and it was my job to lock up. I had to go through the various rooms, make sure the lights were out, <coughs> excuse me, and the final thing would be to go to the front door and close the door, lock up. Why? Because I did not want to make provision for somebody to come in and take anything out of the church, and so I locked up. Spiritually, we need to do the same thing. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that we are to make no provision for the flesh, and uh, we are not to give place to the devil. Jesus said, Satan cometh, he has nothing in me. In other words, I am locked up. I am off bounds. I'm off limits to the enemy. The enemy cannot come and take uh, an area of my life. And we need to do the same thing. We need to guard ourselves. And so Paul closes this portion of Scripture by saying, listen, it's time that we locked up. Make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. And then finally, if I can just add one more it is time to act up because we go back then to verse 11. And he says, do this or this do. Now I'm, taking, I'm making that a positive. In America, the, uh, many, many years ago, we had that expression, it's time to act up, meaning it's time to express who you really are. Tragically, the homosexual community began to act up. They came out, as they call it, they came out of the closet, they made their intentions known. It was no longer we're going to be in shame with what we do, and now, of course, that is a growing problem around the world. But it's time that as Christians, again, we acted up in a good sense, that we began to demonstrate again to the world what it is to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, do this. Don't think about it. Don't uh, just study it and meditate on it and so on and so forth, but act upon it. Somebody prayed in the prayer meeting uh, this morning that we would not just simply be hearers of the Word, but we would be doers. I think too often we are hearers of the Word. We can listen to the Word and uh, critique a message and so on, but uh, Paul says, listen, act up. Do this knowing the time. And I trust this morning that God will stir you, and again, as we spend our week together, and we get into the Word of God, that God, you would allow the Spirit of God to begin to do that work that He wants to do in your life. God is wanting to bring us to a greater realm of understanding, greater realm of maturity in these last days. We need to understand what God is doing and be prepared to be laborers together with Him. Catch a vision of what uh, God's purpose is, and as we begin to explore some of those things this week, I trust that the Spirit of God will, uh, through His Word, begin to change us, motivate us, and that we will begin to fulfill, again, a portion of what we've uh, heard this morning. God bless you.